Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today uh, to discuss uh, the uh, Building Back Democracy, the Biden administration's recent flurry of diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific. Um, this is a joint program, a joint uh, uh, event of the Asia program and the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, both uh, held at the Wilson Center. Uh, we've uh, brought together a real cavalcade of experts um, from the Wilson Center. I'm very pleased to uh, bring everybody on board. I'll give very brief introductions um, and then I'll ask each of our experts to give some short remarks on an aspect of recent diplomacy that's been happening um, and recent events. And then we'll go directly into uh, Q&A. Um, if you uh, have questions that you want to submit uh, to any of the speakers or to the group at large, uh, you can do so on Twitter um, by uh, tweeting at Asia Program. Um, that's probably the, the best way to um, uh, send a question to us. Um, so first, I'll be making some brief remarks on the uh, Quad Summit. Then we'll have Ambassador Stapleton Roy uh, talking about the re return of diplomacy. Then we'll have uh, Ray Jong talking about um, recent uh, incidences of violence and discrimination uh, against Asian Americans. Uh, Robert Daly will be talking about the US-China dynamic. Uh, Shihoko Goto talking about the view from Japan. Michael Kugelman on the view from India. Jean Lee on the Korean Peninsula and Charlie Adele on the view from Australia. Um, so I'll kick things off with um, how the Biden administration kicked things off with a first of its kind uh, summit of leaders uh, amongst the Quad, uh, Japan, India, um, the United States and Australia. Um, and it was a unique and I think uh, potentially historical event both because of the first time the leaders of these four states meeting in this mechanism, um, but also because of what they uh, already decided they wanted to accomplish, which was finding practical areas of non-military cooperation um, that's not specifically targeting uh, competition with China, but rather uh, achieving broader regional public goods that they all believe to be in their interest, primarily announcing a major program for all four countries to work together in various ways uh, to deliver uh, huge amounts of coronavirus vaccines uh, to countries that need it, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, obviously, there is a com an unspoken competitive dynamic of this uh, with China um, in terms of uh, competing with China's efforts to uh, use vaccine diplomacy in Southeast Asia to make sure that those countries have a choice, that there is some degree of, um, uh, 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 that they're not entirely beholden to the PRC on that issue. Um, but even more importantly, I think it begins, uh, hopefully I think the uh, objective is to begin a um, series of non-military practical areas of cooperation between these four major democracies in the Indo-Pacific towards sh shared ends. Now, many have pointed out that um, the weaknesses of the Quad, um, which I think are readily apparent, that its, its role is not very well defined, its objectives are not well defined, it's not institutionalized, there is no secretariat like you have with uh, NATO. Um, there's been a series of articles right, written about how this is nothing like the Asian NATO, um, but I think I, my argument would be that this is actually a strength as much as it is a weakness that as soon as you start to try to define what the quad is, what if you try to start institutionalizing it, um, then you run into some uh, pretty significant challenges uh, amongst the four parties. So I think that keeping it, um, keeping the definition and, and objectives uh, unclear, keeping it away from being institutionalized at this time, I think makes a lot of sense from a strategic point of view and just building those habits of cooperation, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, but it does raise questions about what, what's next. Um, they have announced the establishment of working groups in areas of practical cooperation uh, in, in the areas of vaccines, but also in the areas of technology, and I'm sure other issues will be coming up. Um, I expect this will be both working level and higher, and we're going to see a lot more work in a lot of different areas being done through the Quad. Um, this to me leads to questions about what the Quad means for the regional architecture. Um, how it fits in with existing mechanisms like ASEAN um, and uh, EAS and all those other groupings, and how the United States will decide what issues go into 
the quad bucket, what issues go into the alliances and partnerships, uh, the more bilateral and multilateral um, mechanisms that we have. Um, and I think the next time we're going to see major movement, I expect is if we ever get an in-person summit, uh, potentially on the sidelines of the next East Asia summit, uh, where we have these four, the four leaders, presumably in the same place at the same time, hopefully in person. Um, and I think that will be another opportunity to further move this agenda along and find where it's going to go. But I think the quad is a major new addition to the Asian architecture, and there's still a lot that needs to be figured out. And I'm very interested to hear from my colleagues about how the, this mechanism looks from um, all the other countries in the Indo in the Indo Pacific. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ambassador Stapleton Roy for his broader comments on the return of diplomacy. Go ahead, Stapleton. Uh, thank you, Abe. Uh, good morning. The Biden administration took office, putting domestic issues such as the COVID-19 pandemic, the economy, and immigration ahead of foreign policy and its list of priorities. Two months into the new administration, we can see that this has largely been true. Nevertheless, we live in a world where external factors cannot be put on a shelf to await attention at some future date. So it is not surprising that over the last 10 days, we have seen a flurry of administration activity in the Indo-Pacific region capped by a just concluded contentious meeting with China's top foreign policy leaders in Alaska a few days ago. The administration's foreign policy is still a work in progress, but certain features are glaringly obvious and represent a marked contrast from the previous administration. The Biden administration is reasserting the US leadership role in the world or at least it's attempting to do so. It is giving high priority to demonstrating the US commitment to our alliances in Asia and Europe. Among the administration's first actions were decisions to rejoin the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and again participate in the UN Human Rights Commission. Thorny issues such as the Iran nuclear agreement and the North Korea nuclear issue are receiving expert attention to determine the administration's approach. These steps are consistent with the administration's intention to revitalize American diplomacy, recognizing that the United States, arguably, has been too dependent on military power in recent decades and has demonstrated convincingly that there are many problems for which there are no military solutions. This shift in emphasis will take time to implement. So it is still too early to evaluate the new approach. Some preliminary observations may be worth bearing in mind. First, the US-China bilateral relationship, our biggest challenge at the moment, is still too much driven by domestic factors on each side. This was demonstrated clearly in the combative opening remarks by the two sides in Alaska, which were aimed largely at domestic audiences on each side. It remains to be seen whether this paved the way for progress, however limited, in the private talks. Second, there are still no signs of what the administration's approach will be to economic, trade, and investment issues in East Asia. The Trump tariffs remain in place. The administration has not yet determined its position on the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the new version of the TPP, which the Trump administration abandoned immediately on taking office. These issues are of vital importance in the US competition with China, both globally and in the Indo-Pacific region, where the countries of the region really want the United States to be heavily re-engaged economically and to not simply rely on its military presence as its primary way of asserting the US influence in the region. The administration should take as much time as necessary to adopt the right approach on this vital area of our diplomacy. The administration third, the administration may be biting off more than it can chew in fiscal terms. 
U.S. diplomacy has been grossly underfunded, and the administration is taking a tough line toward both China and Russia, which will only be credible if backed up by robust defense budgets. We are in the early stages of a costly arms race with China, with both sides setting dominance as the goal. At the same time, the administration has correctly affirmed that getting our own house in order is a necessary aspect of meeting the China challenge. Talk may be cheap, but meeting the budgetary demands of these competing objectives will not be. Fortunately, the Biden administration clearly recognizes the urgent need for American diplomacy to play a greater role in advancing US interests abroad. Only time will tell whether it can find the budgetary resources to make this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, for those of you watching, again, if you have questions for me or any of the other audience members, you can uh, tweet them at Asia Program or you can email them to asia at wilsoncenter.org. Um, and now we'll be turning uh, to Ray Jong uh, from the Kissinger Institute. Go ahead. Thanks, Abe. So the question that I was asked to talk about is essentially, to what extent are the um, US-China competitive aspects of their relationship really provoking xenophobia and to comment on the recent spa attacks uh, in the Atlanta, Georgia area? So I wanna start off by saying, you know, most victims of the Atlanta spa attacks were not Chinese, they were Korean, they were American, there were Chinese victims. Um, and this really goes back to, you know, some of, the, and another point that I would add was when Vincent Chin was beaten to death in 1982, it was not out of fear of China, it was a fear of Japan. So what does this indicate? It indicates that it is not the, more precise way that you know policy actors may want to, uh, there to necessarily act to plan but instead it is people who deputize themselves as capable of implementing um, whatever they think is policy change that can impact uh, Asian diaspora communities within the uh, United States. These sort of deputized actors, whether it's um, businesses or communities being suspicious of uh, people of Asian descent or people who think, you know, I can definitely tell who's a spy from China or who's a vector for coronavirus, whatever. Uh, they interpret policy in a way that is different from maybe policy actors. And sometimes policy actors themselves uh, including the previous Trump administration, which consistently used the term China virus, can sort of, you know, help spread certain types of uh, sort of culture clash narratives with China. Um, and as we're looking at instances like the Atlanta spa attacks, we're starting to see, you know, not only the attacks themselves, but um, how they are interpreted maybe by local officials. There was a uh, spokesperson for the uh, county police that said, oh, you know, maybe he was just having a bad day and was just taking it out. Um, and later on, it, as it turned out, he apparently owned and photographed um, himself wearing a COVID came from China t-shirt. Um, and so these images of, you know, Chinese people, Chinese culture as vectors for certain types of, you know, negative policy impacts or negative social impacts, they don't necessarily always emerge from official sources, but they can have very, very local uh, impacts. So often it's not the head, the, you know, direct actions of heads of state and of government officials. But the question is at the end of the day, who are these sorts of foot soldiers to the cause of xenophobia? It is often you know, care, care, carried out by people who don't necessarily follow you know, the talks in Alaska that just um, occurred between the US State Department um, and the Chinese foreign ministry. Um, but when 
foreign policy work, I think, gets really comfortable with the idea of, you know, grouping um, culture, uh, individuals and communities together, then things start to uh, get messy. So right now, as we're starting to really mourn and try to move on from these um, really tragic spa attacks, uh, a lot of the talks that I'm seeing is, you know, what do we do now as a sort of diplomatic community? Well, often there is this phrase that is used, you know, we support the Chinese people, but we abhor what the CCP stands for that is used fairly often. Um, I would I would say that this is this is often not really backed by investment in the Asian communities uh, in a sufficient way. Are people you know listening to what Asian organizers are having to say? Are they familiarizing themselves with Asian American history? You know, for practitioners, are people paying attention to the ethnic stereotypes that you know they or their colleagues have uh, really echoed in past or present work? I think that we as practitioners really build our careers off of studying, analyzing, and really trying to figure out how China, um, China's government works and how it interacts with other states, including the United States. Well, this really, really starts off also at the you know, domestic and diaspora level. China has mo the most discretion over how it controls its domestic spaces, and China's government has also laid claim to Chinese diaspora. So I think that uh, as a field, foreign policy really owes it to um, the Chinese diaspora and the Chinese national community to really conduct work with respect and discretion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, again, for those of you watching, if you have questions, you can tweet it to at Asia program or email at asia at wilsoncenter.org. Next, we'll turn to Robert Daly, the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Wilson Center. Go ahead, Robert. Thanks, Abe. I'd like to touch on three areas. First, a quick analysis of uh, the opening night fireworks or theatrics in Anchorage, what that tells us. Second, uh, the out, not the outcomes, but the aftermath of the meeting, and then a few general notes on what the past week and China's response may say about the course of US-China relations in the near future. Obviously, the contentious discussions that uh, Ambassador Roy mentioned, the opening night in Anchorage got a lot of attention. Secretary of State Blinken began by noting that the United States had, quote, deep concerns with actions by China, including in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, cyber attacks, and economic coercion toward our allies. He then said, each of these actions threaten the rules-based order that maintains global stability. That's why they're not merely internal matters. Now, both Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, were extremely measured, I would say even courteous, gentlemanly in their tone, but the message received from China uh, when this threat to the rules-based order, what the Chinese hear is that you are agents of disorder. Uh, you are, in fact, bullies, economic coercion. So they're hearing very much the same Trump litany. And this, uh, the Trump side would claim, elicited Yang Jiechi's 20-minute response. Uh, I am quite certain that his 20-minute response uh, was teed up, was lying in wait should the opportunity uh, arise, and was not spontaneous. Uh, why do I say that? Um, and why does it matter? Uh, he focused especially on this notion that the United States was speaking from, quote, a position of strength. And it was these remarks of his that were most noted in China afterward. Yang Jiechi in the second round of remarks said, isn't this the intention of the United States, uh, judging from what or the way that you have made your opening remarks, that it wants to speak to China in a condescending way from a position of strength? And he went on from there uh, about that. And, and the phrase here is Shirley de Diwei. Now, the Americans had said nothing about a position of strength in any of their prior remarks. Uh, Jake Sullivan in his opening had said that the US wants to quote, rescue our economy and to affirm the strength and staying power of our democracy. And Secretary Blinken in round two, uh, responding to uh, Yang Jiechi's remarks had said that throughout history, confronting our challenges transparently makes the United States quote, a stronger, better, more united country. Uh, but this is a far cry from saying that the United States was dealing with China 
from a position of strength, a phrase that Yang Jiechi used several times. So Yang wasn't actually responding to their opening statements so much as to a series of statements that the administration has in fact made during the campaign since the election uh, and since the inauguration and to statements that it had made in Tokyo and Seoul. So I think that the, the Yang Jiechi statements are, are best seen as a response to the subject of this whole uh, event today, going back to the Quad and even before. And in fact, Jake Sullivan has frequently spoken of working closely with allies as, quote, building a situation of strength, a, a phrase that was first coined by Dean Acheson. And so what you're hearing really, uh, I think, is a set up set of messages to the Americans secondarily, primarily, as Ambassador Roy said, to the Chinese people by Yang Jiechi. The fact that his key talking point was not triggered by the Americans, I think, cast doubt on its spontaneity. And what we were in fact hearing was an ongoing conversation within China about the United States in, in, a pub, in public. And this was extremely effective. It, Yang Jiechi, uh, who has never been particularly beloved in China, uh, is now a minor hero. Uh, T-shirt slogans being posted, uh, very well received. China was standing up to the United States. Now, did anything come out of these talks? We don't really know yet. A senior US official did say that as soon as the journalists had left the room after that contentious meeting, uh, that China, in fact, you know, got serious and worked through the issue list on the agenda, including nonproliferation and Iran. Uh, and Xinhua subsequently reported that the United States and China were going to continue what they called high level strategic communication, a phrase the American side did not use and, and actually countered when China had made this claim earlier. And the Xinhua article also said that uh, there would be talks, joint talks on the activities of diplomats, the possible reopening of consular missions, uh, and possibly getting reporters back into each other's countries. There are a series of other minor issues that were talked through. Uh, but the highlight, Xinhua said, was that China and the U.S. were committed to, quote, to enhancing communication and cooperation in the field of climate change and will set up a joint working group. Well, this sounds quite positive, quite reasonable, except that a State Department spokesman subsequently said that the two sides, yes, had discussed the climate crisis, but that they didn't form a formal working group. So just as before the event, China said this was a strategic dialogue, and the United States said, no, it isn't either. We had some disagreements subsequently about what had in fact happened. Uh, John Kerry will meet with his Chinese counterpart and EU and Canadian officials tomorrow to discuss climate, but this is a long scheduled meeting, not an outcome of Anchorage. So just a few final of these meetings. First, regarding the opening back and forth, uh, Yang Jiechi noted that it wasn't exactly traditional diplomacy on either side. I think a little traditional diplomacy might have been reassuring uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, rather than focusing on domestic signaling to domestic audiences, uh, it might have been useful to have some public statements about the fact that the rest of the world was watching how this very key, now fairly perilous relationship would be managed. Um, so despite the fact that both sides were playing to domestic audiences, I think both also meant what they said. Uh, they, they laid it out there and there could be a certain use in that. Um, but I think we're ready to move beyond calling out. There's been an awful lot of talk about calling out in both domestic and diplomatic discourse after the, over the past two years. And I think it's time to move on and admit that calling out is not really a strategy. Um, the big question is, is the one that Abe raised in, uh, when he spoke about the Quad. Going forward, what, what now coming out of this meeting? What is the impetus for US-China relations? The administration has spoken a lot about patience. It's in no rush. It wants to conduct its reviews and get China policy right. And that makes a good deal of sense. But patience shouldn't mean just waiting around for something to happen. Obviously, the administration is also focused primarily on national self-restoration and strengthening at home. It doesn't want to rush into taking action or cooperation for their own sakes. And it wants to avoid crises. We know that policy reviews are underway and that the fruits of those reviews will come out in six to eight months. At the same time, we just conducted 10 days of vigorous diplomacy and we issued direct challenges to China and we have had those challenges answered in a way that indicates it's already game on. There's no six to eight month hiatus that is going to happen now. So my concern is that if we don't take deliberate directive action, even in a small way soon, 
the subsequent course of the relationship might be overdetermined by crises. Xi Jinping likes to use a nautical metaphor to talk about the relationship. He says it's like a ship. And he says that the ballast, the stabilizing factor, is economics. I would argue that what we need right now is not ballast, but a propeller and a rudder. We need some kind of motive force and a direction. The relationship's moorings have been cut, and right now the ship is drifting. So I think the time is right for specific small-scale policy proposals that move in a cooperative or at least non-antagonistic direction to try to give some impetus, no matter how small, to this ship. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Xi Jinping uses nautical metaphors a lot in his speeches. I, I haven't seen a paper on that yet, but it's an interesting theme in a lot of his papers. It's in a lot of his speeches. It's, it's kind of strange. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, before we get to our next speaker, just a reminder for the audience, if you have questions or comments, please, uh, you can tweet them to at Asia program, or email them to asia at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, next up is uh, Shihoka Goto from the Asia program on the view from Japan. Go ahead. Great. Thanks so much, Abe. So Japan was actually the first country uh, for the Blinken Austin team to visit as Biden's new foreign policy group. And for all intents and purposes, the two plus two meetings in Tokyo were a great success. And it was a public diplomacy win for both sides. And it demonstrated how the Biden administration sees Japan as a key regional partner in the comprehensive US strategy in the US uh, for the Indo-Pacific by the United States. And this relationship will continue to build um, as Prime Minister Suga is expected to be the first foreign leader to visit President Biden at the White House in early April. The Tokyo visit uh, reassured Japan primarily on three issues. Uh, first is that the United States is now re-engaging in the Indo-Pacific and it is prioritizing engagement in Asia over the Middle East or Europe or elsewhere in the world. Um, this is an opportunity uh, for the rebalance to Asia started in the Obama administration to actually be completed fully. Um, and the meeting is seen as this first step to that completion of the pivot. Uh, the second reassurance was that uh, there is this US uh, commitment to multilateralism that is actually seen through actions and not simply by rhetoric that the Biden administration is committed to not just talking about multilateral cooperation, but actually showing up, engaging, listening, and to plan out actions. And then thirdly, uh, Japan was greatly reassured by the hawkish stance uh, that the United ha States has towards China uh, that was really uh, voiced clearly under the Trump administration, but he continued under the Biden administration as well. Um, and that's particularly important for Japan as Chinese encroachment in the East China Sea escalates um, on the one hand and its challenges with China's economic competition increases on the other. But what is interesting to note is that the latest meeting reaffirmed common interest and a shared agenda whilst carefully avoiding potential sources of conflict. So um, the potential sources of conflict are likely to emerge when we deal with uh, the reality of meeting the China challenge. Because although China is Japan's biggest security threat, it is also uh, Japan's biggest trading partner that surpasses the United States. And the big question for Japan will be how and to what extent decoupling from, uh, from China is possible. And it's an issue that Japan, as well as other Asian countries and European nations will not necessarily see eye to eye with the United States. And that could certainly be a source of great contention between Japan and the United States when Suga arrives in Washington in April. Um, after the Blinken Motegi meeting, there was a release of a statement on US-Japan uh, cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. And there was a, uh, it was it particularly pointed out 
the need for deepening economic cooperation and identified five areas, that is to say climate change, clean energy, cybersecurity, supply chains, and cooperation on COVID. And yes, uh, these are all certainly areas that both countries uh, can cooperate. And it's also uh, ripe for partnerships, both on the public, but also on the private sector level as well. But given that Japan doesn't see eye to eye with the United States uh, when dealing with the economic challenge posed by China, there's still confusion really about how to further that economic cooperation. And certainly COVID has exposed vulnerabilities of supply chains worldwide and the risk of overdependence on China. And also uh, the US-China trade war that had really uh, taken flight under the Trump administration has highlighted the geopolitical risks that could be posed by the United States itself. And Japan is currently in the midst of trying to identify new economic relations, both with China as well as with the United States. And it's also trying to carve out its own economic as well as security future as well. And so like the rest of the world, as Japan tries to deal with the disruptions and economic setbacks uh, established posed by COVID, there's also recognition that there needs to be more fundamental change to deal with the broader issues of technology disruption and the automation challenges that will be facing the global co economy moving forward. And also the rise of economic nationalism across the board. And those hurdles are not necessarily going to be conducive to uh, identifying opportunities for economic cooperation. And Japan's other concern about the United States is about, is about Washington's ability to balance competition and cooperation with China. So yes, um, the United States has prioritized climate change and that is seen as an opportunity for Washington and China to cooperate further. Uh, but how can uh, Washington actually balance that need for cooperation with China on the one hand and ensure competition and being able to push back against China on the other. This is something that will continue to be at the forefront of concern for the Japanese um, leadership. And finally, I, I want to point out that uh, Prime Minister Suga himself is hemmed in by his own domestic challenges. He needs to call a general election by September at the latest, even as his popularity continues to wane. And he's having great difficulties in dealing with the spread of COVID. And he also has the challenge of hosting the Summer Olympic Games, which is assumed to be going ahead. Uh, but at this stage, um, it will not be allowing foreign tourists to actually come in to be part of the games. So Suga will be focused on his own, on Japanese domestic politics and his own personal survival. And what the United States does not want is a return to the uh, era of Japanese politics previous to the Shinzo Abe administration when there was a revolving door of prime ministers at a time when there is more to be expected from Japan as a regional leader to push back against China. So let me leave it at that. Very good, thank you so much, Shioko. Um, again, uh, for the audience, if you do have questions, we have a few questions in already. Uh, please, you can tweet them to uh, at Asia Program or email them at asia at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, next, we'll be turning to Michael Kugelman from the Asia Program on The View from India. Go ahead, Michael. Well, thanks, Abe. Um, so just first, a bit of quick context. India is in a different category from the other countries we're discussing today. India is neither a U.S. treaty ally nor a strategic rival. It falls into the category of major defense partner. And this has entailed stepped up security cooperation in uh, recent years with a number of arms sales and the inking of foundational agreements that the US likes to sign with its top defense partners. And these allow for closer uh, military to military cooperation and facilitate more interoperability. Much of, the, much of this increased cooperation is fueled by shared concern about China. So against that backdrop, I'll offer uh, three quick thoughts on how New Delhi has looked at all this US diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific and especially Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's visit to India over the weekend. So first, 
uh, India is encouraged about what it is seeing. India views this intense and early US diplomacy as a strong indication of the new administration's desire to shore up its partnerships in Asia to push back against China. The China issue now occupies a central and urgent position in New Delhi's thinking, and especially since a deadly border clash with Chinese troops last summer, which really woke India up to the threat of China on its border. Uh, India has long viewed Beijing as its greatest long-term strategic challenge, and that clash strengthened that perception even more. Uh, India recently signed a border ceasefire with its other main rival, Pakistan, and it likely did that in part to free up more bandwidth and resources to direct to the border with China. India sees the US as an essential partner in its effort to address this China threat, albeit as a partner, not an ally. And so it has been heartened to see the Biden administration engaging uh, with its treaty allies and partners, both bilaterally and through the Quad, to generate a common front to better counterbalance China. Second point, uh, New Delhi was very curious and perhaps a bit nervous as well about what Austin's messaging would be on two key issues during his trip to India, one of which is a rare tension point in the security relationship, the other of which could become one. So first is India's uh, S-400 missile system deal with Russia. This is of course uh, problematic for the US potentially because of the Katsa sanctions and the very real possibility that the US could slap sanctions on one of its most important defense partners in Asia. And what Austin said, at least publicly, was not terribly reassuring to India. Uh, he said that the US hasn't had, has not had to make a decision about sanctions because the S-400 platform hasn't yet been delivered to India. Uh, he then said that the US does sometimes work with countries that have acquired arms from Russia, but he also said that the US really doesn't like this, doesn't want this to happen. So while there, I think there's a very good chance that India will ultimately get a waiver, uh, that it won't be sanctioned, uh, and this CASA legislation does allow for that, sanctions still remain potentially on the table, a possibility. And certainly for, for New Delhi, that's a major concern as sanctions would be a major blow to the relationship, probably uh, the worst in several decades, and it could well undermine its cooperation with the US and the other Quad countries on the China issue. The other issue that New Delhi was wondering about in terms of what Austin would say was that of democracy and human rights. So India, uh, or the current government in particular, does not like other countries, including its close partners, to comment on its internal affairs. And India has certainly experienced a degree of democratic backsliding in recent years. And it knows that the Biden administration plans to make democracy a promotion, a cornerstone of its foreign policy. Uh, Senator uh, Menendez, the Senate Foreign Relations Chair, uh, he had written a letter to Austin uh, prior to the trip asking him to bring this issue of democracy up along with the S-400 deal. And New Delhi's expectation, which I think is accurate, is that this administration will generally restrict its messaging on democracy and rights to private conversations with New Delhi. Uh, Austin did bring it up publicly, albeit briefly, when a journalist asked him a question and he said that he brought up discrimination against Muslims in talks with Indian ministers, though not in his chat with Prime Minister Modi. Um, and according to what I've heard from, from folks in, in New Delhi, uh, that even this brief reference and the fact that it was made publicly did not really go down very well with Indian officials. And you know, the issue of democracy will, will not go away, uh, given that US governments, including the Biden administration, have stated that shared values, including democracy, helped drive the bilateral relationship. And this is meant to draw a contrast with China. And similarly, the core messaging around the Quad emphasizes this idea of four democracies working together to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific in contrast to undemocratic China and its undemocratic vision for the region. My third and, and final point relates to the conceptual dimension of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, New Delhi has been paying a lot of attention to how the new administration is defining the Indo-Pacific as it undertakes its Indo-Pacific diplomacy. And this, uh, this definitional factor means matters a lot in US-India relations because there's long been a perceived disconnect. Uh, New Delhi believes that the US accords the most strategic focus to the Eastern parts of the Indo-Pacific, East Asia, and especially the South China Sea, where, where China's actions have imperiled uh, the interest of US treaty allies. India, by contrast, is more concerned about the Western part of the Indo-Pacific, the Western parts of the Indian Ocean region, because it perceives the threat of China on its border and off its waters as its most significant threat. 
it was quite telling that China was barely, if at all, mentioned explicitly in any of Austin's public comments while in India or in any of the public comments made by the officials who met with him there. But it is notable that the Indian defense minister referenced the threat posed by, quote, unreported and illegal fishing in the Indian Ocean region, which I think was clearly a reference to Chinese activities in the IOR, in the Indian, Indian Ocean um, near India. Now, in a development that was seen with great interest in New Delhi, a Pentagon press release announcing Austin's trip to India had said that Austin would speak to Indian officials about cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and the Western Indian Ocean. And it's relatively unusual for that latter term to be used in high-level Pentagon messaging about US-India relations. And so in a tweet after his meetings in India, Austin used the term as well. Additionally, recent reporting on the Biden administration indicates that it is increasingly concerned about China's development of the port of Gwadar in southern Pakistan, part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. These US references to the Western Indian Ocean region closer to home for India, so to speak, will be heartening uh, to New Delhi and perhaps an indication uh, from its perspective that the Biden administration is willing to better acknowledge the threats posed by China to India in the Western Indian Ocean region. So thank you, I'll end there. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next, we'll be turning to uh, my colleague, Jean Lee, who's director of the Kissinger Center Inside the Asia Program. Uh, go ahead, Jean. Well, I'm glad to have been promoted to director of the Kissinger Center. But I'm <laughs> the, the Korea Center, my bad. <laughs> I, I, I welcome the new challenge. Now, I'm the director of the Korea Center at the Wilson Center. And um, I just want to warn you, I've got a very vocal dog in my lap. So I'm trying to keep him quiet. But if you see him pop up, that's, that's what's going on. Um, I wanted to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the killings um, in Atlanta first, um, just because I did not sleep well last night. I think um, those, those um, killings have really weighed on the minds of so many Asian Americans like me and brought up, certainly forced us to revisit the trauma that we faced uh, as Asian Americans. And I wanna thank Ray for acknowledging the importance of Asian American history and understanding how that has impacted how, uh, how people see Asian Americans. But I think it's also important to look at the language and policy toward Asia and as, as well the US presence in Asia and how that contributes to the culture of violence. Okay, moving on. I would say that um, for, on the view from Seoul, you know, the highlight uh, was that this was the first two plus two meeting of the US Secretary of State and um, the Defense Secretary with South Korean partners um, since an Obama administration meeting in DC in 2016. Um, and as the South Korean foreign minister pointed out, it's the first time they've had this meeting in Seoul since 2010, so it's been 11 years. So just the decision to send these two top envoys uh, on defense and diplomacy to Asia, and particularly to Seoul, uh, and this is building on what Shihoko said, on the first foreign trip of the Biden administration was very much appreciated in Seoul. I would say that there has been some anxiety in Seoul over the delay in the completion of the North Korea policy review uh, and a lot of concerns that the Biden administration may be returning to uh, a form of strategic patience. Uh, and certainly there's a strong desire on the part of the Moon administration for Washington to make quick outreach to Pyongyang and to clear the way for Seoul to engage Pyongyang with inter-Korean projects. And there's a, a good reason um, for this impatience. President Moon Jae-in of South Korea has just one year left in his five-year term. And South Korea's constitution only allows one year, um, one five-year presidential term. And so, and, and a reminder that engaging North Korea has been a major um, component of his presidential platform. So the meeting comes at a time uh, Sorry, this trip comes at a time when North Korea has withdrawn into self-isolation, both diplomatically and economically. And not only does this put the people of North Korea at risk of deepening hardship, um, but this comes as the North Korean leadership has vowed to build an even more powerful nuclear warhead. Uh, and I did note yesterday that North Korea closed its embassy in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, this was because over a protest over a decision by Malaysia to extradite a North Korean citizen to the United States to face charges uh, of money laundering and sanctions violations. So very interesting show perhaps of a shift in alliances in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, so very interesting case to watch. Um, now, 
Secretary Blinken had some key objectives uh, as, as um, Ambassador Roy mentioned to reinvigorate and really uh, restore the alliances in the region, particularly with um, Japan and South Korea, and to perhaps try to help manage the complicated relationship between these two countries. Of course, the security issues, particularly that threat that's posed by North Korea, uh, we was welcome in Seoul to hear uh, Secretary Blinken say that the policy review would be revealed in a matter of weeks uh, in close coordination and consultation with South Korea and Japan. Uh, and, and it was noted, however, perhaps with some dismay, the mention of re the review of pressure options. And perhaps that I think we can guess that that means including and expanding sanctions as part of the diplomatic arsenal. Uh, there was a kerfuffle over the language used around denuclearization, and this is an ongoing issue of semantics and policy. Slight difference in how the South Koreans have phrased it versus the Americans. Uh, so that's certainly something that needs to be clarified in the weeks, months, and years ahead. And of course, the recognition that they uh, are looking, that the United States is looking to establish some partnership and shared values when it comes to China. And that's certainly a concern that South Korea has. A lot of uh, discomfort under the Trump administration or during the Trump administration over having to choose between the United States and China. So South Korea is certainly looking at how they will navigate that strategic relationship and how it will impact uh, not only North Korea policy, but also its economic future. Uh, and so, it, you know, we were also looking to see very closely if North Korea would assert itself during uh, this visit, because if you recall four years ago, when Pre then President Trump met with then uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan, there was an ICBM launch from North Korea. So thankfully we did not see any type of major provocation we did see Kim Jong-un's sister make a statement after a long silence from North Korea. Uh, and that was really designed to put some pressure on South Korea to, to stick with inter-Korean unity rather than siding too closely with the United States. But I would say that the messaging rather than the provocations are a strong suggestion that Pyongyang is still watching and waiting before it makes its next major move. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And uh, your, your dog is always welcome to join us on these uh, in these events. Um, he certainly has a lot of uh, important views of, of its own. Um, uh, for uh, before we turn to our last uh, our formal speaker, if you could uh, just a, a final uh, reminder for the audience, if you have questions or comments, please direct them on Twitter to Asia program, or I should say at Asia program and then email is Asia at WilsonCenter.org. Uh, next, we'll be turning to Charles Adele, uh, who is not Australian, but we'll be talking about Australia. He's uh, served as a senior fellow at the U.S. Study Center at the University of Sydney. Go ahead, Charlie. Uh, thanks very much, Abe. Although after that last conversation, uh, I kicked my dog out of my office, and now I want to bring her back so she can just give you her point of view. Um, Look, I just uh, overall, let me just thanks for the invitation to join uh, today's event and to add my two cents about what we've just heard. And as Abe noted, uh, I'm not Australian. All of you should be able to tell that by my accent. Uh, but we did re just return uh, from uh, living in Australia for the last three and a half years. Uh, so I thought I would gear some of my initial comments towards Australia, uh, and particularly in the context of ways to judge Australia's reaction uh, to this initial diplomatic flurry. I would start by saying, um, look, Australia should be seen in some ways as an outlier to some of the trends that we've been discussing. Uh, it's really the only country to have improved its relationship with the United States across the board uh, during the last four years. It's the only country to have escaped a punishment in the form of tariffs. And it's the only country that we've been talking about that did not get a visit last week. Uh, now, it got a Zoom call uh, for the Quad Leaders meeting, yes, it got an op-ed in the Washington Post, and it got a phone call between our respective uh, departments of defense and one between John Kerry and Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Uh, yes, all those, but no visit, uh, or at least not yet, uh, though I would note that this is the 70th anniversary year of the ANZUS Treaty that occurs later this year, and there's an expectation of some high-level visits to mark that equation. But in some more substantive ways, though, uh, Australia is right at the center of things. Uh, 
uh, and in many ways, I would say, has been helping encourage a new, new US approach, uh, some of the fruits of which we saw playing out over the last two weeks. Uh, and perhaps I should recalibrate that statement because I think Australia is less at the center and more at the forefront of dealing with China's increasing use of economic coercion. Uh, that can be seen very clearly uh, through the marked uptick in Beijing's uh, use of punitive measures against Australia since April, restrictions on Australian barley, meat, wine, cotton, coal, uh, and even more ham-handedly through the Chinese embassy in Australia's public list of 14 points of grievances it delivered to Australia back in November, which include banning Huawei from the rollout of Australia's 5G, passing foreign interference legislation, calling for an independent international inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus, and of course, general anger at the Australian media for investigative journalism, Australian politicians for their statements condemning uh, Beijing's aggressions, and Australian think tanks for producing research that highlights forced labor in and beyond Xinjiang. Uh, let me add that Canberra's moves this past summer, uh, both on their own and together with the United States, offer perhaps a precursor to some of what's to come in the region that we've begun talking about with the Quad. Uh, now, for those of you who are not tracking Australian politics and policy quite closely, uh, let me note that last summer, Australia released both their defense strategic update and their force structure plan and held um, a met uh, for Osman, the annual two plus two of foreign affairs and defense with their American counterparts. Now, all of the deliverables were quite noteworthy um, and I won't go into them, but I will say that they were the most meaty deliverables since at least 2012 and taken together probably represent a significant shift in Australia's strategic posture, uh, an increase in defense spending the acquisition of more potent strike capabilities and a more regionally focused defense posture. Now, that's the background and the context for these past few weeks of diplomatic activity from Washington. So let me offer three quick thoughts on how this is playing out. Uh, during the transition, and to a lesser degree ever since the inauguration, uh, I noted a sense of raising, raised concerns coming out of Australia. These include concerns that Biden would lean on them and punish them uh, for their climate policies, that Australia's special status uh, would drop relative to other allies, and perhaps at a more ex existential level, uh, where exactly the Biden administration would land on China and concern that if it didn't land in the right place, according to Australia, Australia will be left isolated and exposed and might become roadkill or collateral damage in the US-China uh, competition. Uh, so Second, uh, I'd also note that despite these concerns, there were and there still are rising expectations coming out of Canberra about what the new administration might do with Australia. This is particularly acute regarding what Washington would have to say about Beijing's ongoing economic coercion of Australia. Uh, Kurt Campbell's statement, and China any improvement in relations until Beijing stops its economic coercion of Australia, that's a quote on the eve of the Anchorage meetings has gotten great play down there, but also begs the question of what particular policy actions will accompany such a statement. Uh, finally, I point to the rising expectations of what the US-Australia alliance can do and the changing nature of the relationship. Uh, both sides are now hoping and expecting more from each other. And the alliance has the potential to shift to a more equal partnership based on mutual needs. And if I'm going to editorialize, uh, I'd add that both initial steps, uh, steps to balance China and engage the US more in the Indo-Pacific militarily and in the non-military spaces are likely to be encouraged, uh, welcomed, and potentially met with similar actions of their own. That's it. Great, thank you, Charlie. Um, so now we'll, we'll move to the Q&A portion of this uh, for the audience. We have several questions already, but again, uh, you can tweet at Asia Program or email asia at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, first question is for everybody, um, and I, I'm not going to call anybody. You can just raise your hands or start talking um, to go over how the region, your sense of how the region is reacting to uh, the uh, public spat between the U.S. and China um, that we all saw in Anchorage. Uh, Charlie talked about this a bit. Some of the others have talked about this as well. But I'd be curious, one, on one hand, how you're 
area of expertise that seems to be reading that, how your countries of, of focus have been reacting. Um, but also for those of you who do focus on uh, US-China relations, um, do you um, uh, agree with uh, that, how some have pointed that this is, that this was uh, overly aggressive, uh, overly focused on domestic audiences, or do you see it as others have written as more of a necessary corrective um, and a way to set a tone uh, for more realistic expectations um, with Beijing. Um, so really, I could just throw that open, see who has reactions to that. I expect Robert does, Charlie, I expect those as well. Um, who wants to go first? Or I could just call on, on Robert and get it started that way. Go ahead, Robert. Well, um, I think first whether, what we make of that first spat, uh, I, I, I thought it could have, it probably would have been best to have avoided it. I mean, my, my own preference would have been to signal strength and resolve uh, through tone, through you know body language in a, in a quick two minute statement. It's, it would have been fairly easy to say something like, we know that we're here under very difficult circumstances. This is a competitive relationship uh, that has implications for the whole world. We're determined to try to manage it as well as we can. There, there are ways to have kept it open without, you know, getting right down into the accusations, but if the people who made these decisions on behalf of the administration are experienced and sophisticated. So that, that's not an accident, that's a deliberate choice uh, to send a message. Whether or not uh, it was the best move, it's also something that's easily overcomable uh, by what happens next. I think that the Chinese audiences, I assume the regional audiences are sophisticated enough to understand the theatrical aspects of it. Uh, this is the argument that it's best to clear the air, right? Uh, and that's why I finished my presentation by talking about next steps. Uh, if we can do something, however minor, while waiting for the completion of policy reviews that indicates to Americans, China, and the rest of the world that there is actual scope and interest in competing, then the fireworks in Anchorage quickly become last month's news. It's, it's really a question of what the next steps are going to be. Great. Uh, thank you, Robert. Charlie? You had some comments as well? Uh, sure. Um, I, I think I take the view that this was a necessary corrective uh, and uh, we shouldn't be surprised and people in the region, uh, at least in the areas of uh, the parts of the region uh, that I'm looking at are not overly concerned uh, once they get past the rhetorical fireworks. Um, you know, Tom Wright had a really good article, I think, uh, saying that what this allowed us to do was to skip uh, the time wasting where we talk about managing differences uh, as the first issue and putting competition as a second one and also allows us to get real that there are some real stark uh, issues that are actually the primary ones that we have to deal with, not the secondary or tertiary ones. Uh, I, I also want to say one quick thing um, about uh, the note that uh, you know, there's a lot of domestic signaling and uh, wishing that we could have skipped that. Uh, that's inevitably true, but it's not the only way to view this. Uh, because when you're doing public diplomacy with cameras rolling, you are speaking to more than one audiences at once. And so I think keeping those cameras rolling, uh, making sure that one, that the United States is coming to the table with the concerns of its allies, uh, first and foremost, and letting everyone see just how aggressive uh, Beijing was with the US uh, strikes me as making sure and foot stomping uh, the initiative that the United States is approaching the Indo-Pacific region uh, with uh, Asia uh, and allies and China as a subset of that, not the reverse of that. That is not having China be synonymous with Indo-Pacific and everyone else becomes a subset of that. I think that's an important signal, not just to the domestic audiences, but quite in, uh, deliberately and internationally to our allies and partners as well. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Shihoko, your thoughts? Yeah, um, so just to echo what's already been said, uh, what happened in Anchorage, um, the footage that we saw, uh, was seen very much in the Japanese press as something that the two countries were doing for their own domestic audiences. So that it was high drama, it made good television, uh, but it was seen very much as something that was uh, not really um, 
addressing the root of the issue. But at the same time, it did reinforce in Japan this sense that Japan not only has to redefine its relations with the United States, but also with China as well. So there is this two-pronged approach about Japan um, trying to figure out its own um, international space in the future. Um, I, I did, what I did not mention um, in my opening remarks um, when we talk about the potential of US-Japan cooperation, um, especially when it comes to um, supply chains, um, is that we know that there are issues that the two sides will want to work together on um, and supply chains and actually having a stable source of supplies and materials is something that um, is, is going to be a big challenge moving forward. Uh, but at the same time, what we are understanding at the moment is that um, when you look at a, a product like semiconductors, we've seen this tremendous demand for semiconductors all over the world, um, not just for uh, the, the obvious, the, the um, IT stuff, but also the things like, like cars uh, as well. And when Japan and the United States talk about cooperation on such a critical issue as supply chains, it isn't simply about uh, reshoring from China. It isn't simply about keeping technology away from China. It really is about having this balance and understanding about what is a critical material for the global economy moving forward and how much countries are prepared to invest and what their own national interests are. So in the, in the example of semiconductors, um, they are very costly to make and they're not incredibly profitable. That's why countries like the United States don't really invest in it. Uh, when we talk about cooperation between Japan and the United States, which are seemingly uh, eye to eye when it comes to security issues in the region. But what are we going to do about economic security moving forward? How are we going to invest and make sure that there is a steady supply and there is no forced technology transfer into China? These are all issues that are rising up. And what the Anchorage drama shows is that the United States may not necessarily uh, be always, although it puts up this rhetoric of working together with partners, that it might not be the best conduit or the best uh, spokesperson for what all the allies want. Um, and there is a lot of uh, uh, concern and a lot of um, ways to kind of push for a third way moving forward in Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Shihoko. Michael, you have some thoughts. Yeah, in terms of the uh, the U.S.-China public spat uh, in India, it was it was received uh, quite well, quite positively, predictably, particularly among those that are hawks uh, on China. Um, it was it was a big discussion point in all the major uh, TV talk shows as well, um, and I think that many viewed it as an indication that the Biden administration um, won't be a, a pushover uh, when it comes to, uh, to China. Uh, there has been some concern there that, uh, you know, to, a tendency to associate um, this administration with the Obama administration, uh, just because you have so many uh, folks, including the, our, our new president, uh, who had served in the Obama administration with this perception that the Obama administration was not as tough on China. So it was received very positively. Uh, also, some, some were a bit surprised. Um, uh, given that there was an expectation that um, the Biden administration would not necessarily um, resort to these types of, um, ex not exhibitions, but the manifestations, hardline manifestations, getting away from uh, traditional diplomacy. That was a bit of a surprise to some. But I think the main thing to keep in mind here is that India's reaction to this incident was shaped by its own thinking about China right now, which is much different than it had been before you had that border clash last summer that deadly border clash that plunged relations to their lowest level in several decades. So previously, if this had happened another time, uh, you know, India may not have reacted as favorably uh, to what had happened because of a traditional tendency in, uh, in New Delhi to be very cautious with its relationship with China uh, and wanting to use the US to be relatively cautious with it as well. But again, it's a whole new ball game in New Delhi now, given that its relationship with China is in a, in a worse place than it's been for quite some time. Thank you, Michael. Um, before we move on, uh, I wanted to check with Ambassador Roy to see if he had any reactions since he talked about it in his uh, initial uh, remarks. Stape, do you have other uh, uh, reactions or thoughts on this topic? 
Got to get you unmuted there. Let's see. There okay. you go. Uh, I agree generally with the comments that have been made. Uh, toughness is an attitude. It is not a policy. Um, much of my diplomatic career was spent dealing with the Soviet Union and China. And these were countries with whom we had uh, the most serious problems. And I have been in very confrontational meetings in which high level officials have uh, raised their voices, uh, even flung briefing books onto the floor in order to make a point. So toughness is something that has a role in diplomacy, but it is most useful when it's designed to underline a point and to lead to serious negotiations. Uh, I have also seen toughness prevent engagement when engagement was necessary to address the problems between the countries involved. So the toughness can either work or not work, depending on how it's being used. I think the discussion and the comments made so far brings out the contradiction in the way that Indo-Pacific countries look at the US-China relationship because they want the United States engaged in the region to balance the rise of China. But there's not a single country in the region that would benefit from a US-China conflict. And therefore, in many ways, the most important factor is if the diverse interests of the region come together to think that the United States is handling its relationship with China in a skillful manner that takes into account the varied interests of the Asian countries, then we have a successful Asian policy. But if countries feel the United States or China is being too confrontational with the other, then they become concerned that they will be caught up in a dogfight, which is not of their choosing and which will not serve their interests. So this is the fine line that has to be walked in deciding how to use toughness as a diplomatic factor in your dealing with a very important issue on which hinges your overall approach to the region as a whole. At the moment, it's not surprising that India, which has been in a confrontation with, uh, uh, with, with China on the border, uh, more severe than the rise in tensions on the border that has happened frequently, is more comfortable with a confrontational American Chinese uh, approach to each other than are some of the other countries. Uh, but in Southeast Asia, countries worry if the United States and China seem to be going at each other in a way that will spill over and force them to choose sides when they do not wish to choose sides. So that's the only comment I would add to this. I think both sides, we've seen both sides of the issue. And what we don't know yet is how this is going to play out down the road. Uh, if it enables the United States to be more nuanced in its diplomacy because it has shown that it can be tough with China when it needs to be tough, then it will work in our benefit. Um, Great. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, next question is specifically for Ray. Um, but of course, you all can uh, weigh in as well if you have. But um, wait, Ray, you do a lot of work on technology issues at the Wilson Center. And the Quad um, established a critical and emerging technology working group coming out of the summit. So I'm curious if you could give your thoughts on what you see as the possible avenues uh, for tech cooperation within the Quad and what that may mean for uh, competition with, with the Chinese. 
Sure. So information sharing has probably been one of the goals for the United States to try to shore up. Um, this has been something that American allies have been asking a lot of questions about, about not just in the Quad, but also uh, in Europe in terms of telecommunications technology. So trust building um, is, is going to be something that is a big question, especially uh, when it comes to uh, Chinese corporation produced technology. So um, traditionally market access to China's supply chain has been a big factor for quad countries, for European countries. Uh, Europe and the United Kingdom specifically are in the process of working out trade deals um, with China. And um, domestically, technology has been a very high priority in the recent high level meetings that China held. Um, and there are essentially sort of uh, two or three um, sort of key developments, but on the part of the Chinese government. The first is sort of political adherence. Uh, recently, Alibaba, one of China's biggest big data uh, corporations, uh, was sort of the center of regulator attention in terms of antitrust, but also in terms of political closeness to the party. Uh, the second is sort of global competitiveness. Building a digital service sector has long been a goal of um, the Chinese government. The third is sort of engagement in providing, you know, ways for technology and other products to fill in service gaps. So um, selling 5G at affordable prices has been a really big part of um, Chinese diplomatic efforts within the last couple of years. And so, um, what the United States and other quad members are going to have to look at is the sort of complicated questions of um, competing with a Chinese government that has made um, technology policy, technology norms a priority. Thank you, Ray. Um, so next we have an external question uh, for the audience. If you do have a question or comment, you can tweet at Asia Program, email asia at wilsoncenter.org. This question is from Liz Kim, who's the uh, from the Voice of America's Korean service. And it's a question uh, directed to the China experts in, in, uh, on the call. And the question is, during last week's trip, Secretary Blinken asked China to pressure North Korea into abandoning its nuclear program, saying China's economic ties with uh, Pyongyang give it tremendous influence and a shared interest in ending the nuclear program. Um, he also said that the United States and China had a kind of conversation on a range of issues, including North Korea during the meeting in Alaska. Uh, to your mind, do you think there's room for the US and China to compete on North Korea nuclear issues when there are many thorny issues between the two countries? Uh, so this is uh, potentially an evergreen question, uh, but I, with added salience for the new Biden administration. Um, I'll turn to Robert and I, I suspect maybe Charlie and Steve have some thoughts. Also, uh, uh, Gene, if you have some reaction to that, I'd be very interested in that too. Uh, Robert, go ahead. What was the question whether there's room, they said compete, but was it compete or was cooperation what was meant Is here? there room for the US and China to cooperate on the North Korean ah. nuclear issue when there are many thorny issues between the two countries? Well, as, as you said, this is, this is evergreen and it, it could easily fill uh, the rest of the morning with speculation. Uh, obviously, uh, it remains true that there cannot be a solution to the Korean Peninsula issues with which all parties, very much including China and the United States, are satisfied. So there has to be cooperation. There ha they have to uh, work together to find a mutually satisfactory solution. Like, this isn't something that they will uh, that they can do in isolation from each other. That's a very simple answer to a very complicated uh, question, but we don't really know much coming out of these talks about the specifics of what they discussed. Clearly, they're, they're going to have to be, you know, cooperative efforts at some stage in the process. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Gene, maybe I'll turn to you um, for how does this look from the, the perspective of the North Koreans? We often hear from American interlocutors, uh, American policymakers, China has influence on North Korea. Um, how, how true is that from a North Korean perspective? And how do they look at the prospect of Chinese influence, uh, Chinese pressure and US-China cooperation? Uh, on to pressure them to denuclearize. 
Yeah, I would just make uh, one point, which is there is one country in the region that does benefit from tension between US and China, and that is North Korea. Uh, the worst, one of the, one of the harder things for North Korea will be if there is cooperation between the US and China, and, the, and the, if the US is able to get Beijing on board with, part in particular, its sanction strategy, uh, that would make it very hard for North Korea to kind of um, work that China, North Korea diplomatic channel to its advantage. So I do think that this has to be part of the broader US strategy on how to deal with North Korea is to find ways to cooperate with China uh, so that they have more leverage as the region when it comes to restraining North Korea. So I just wanted to make that one point that there is that, that it's in North Korea's interest. But I would say that if North Korea is thinking strategically in the long run, um, that it could be a, now it's going to be, a, it's going to seem counterintuitive, but I do think that, uh, I hope that Pyongyang recognizes that in the long run, if they're looking for a kind of step-by-step -step strategy on the, on the nuclear negotiations, that it wouldn't be harmful to have a kind of regional understanding. And I think that if they see some cooperation developing, uh, that we might see China and North Korea pushing for more of a multilateral uh, discussion hosted by China. So it'll be interesting to see how all this plays out. Great, other comments uh, before I move on to our next question? Okay. Um, so, as an aside, as the when I came into the Wilson Center as uh, director of the Asia program, I was concerned that there was a separate program on uh, the U.S.-China relationship uh, in the Kissinger Institute run by Robert Daly, and it's been a tremendously effective and congenial relationship because Robert is a very non-territorial person and a very great colleague. So I feel like I owe it to him to return the favor of not being territorial and see to him. Um, the uh, the role as moderator, so he can ask a, a question of his own. So, uh, Robert, go ahead. Okay, well, not, not just a questioner, not moderator. And this really, I guess it's for you, Abe, it's for Charlie, um, anyone else who wants to comment. I was very pleased with Kurt Campbell's statement to Australia uh, that it was going, we were going to stand with Australia and couldn't uh, really get our, relation, our economic relationship with China in shape until it stopped coercing Australia. But uh, do either of you see dangers in that in terms of creating expectations going forward? Is that a one-off or is it a doctrine? You know, South Korea uh, felt at the time and remains disappointed that we didn't uh, come to its aid more when it was being coerced after the installation of the THAAD system. This, does this create an expectation now throughout the region or beyond that if any country is feeling coerced by China, that the United States uh, will be with it? Uh, how, how do you view that, that what Kurt Campbell's statement regionally? How will it be received regionally? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a great question, Robert. I, I think it um, it's reflected in one of the remarks that uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken made um, in Anchorage, uh, saying that we have friends in the region um, and that these relationships are important to us. Um, to me, it was a part of a broader message, not just about Australia, but that how China treats our allies will affect the US-China relationship, that these are not separate concepts and that the US won't be able to um, engage in a friendly and positive relationship if China continues to coerce uh, our, our allies. Um, and that to me, I think is a very welcome and necessary message. But of course, as it is often with the Chinese, if you're sending a message, you gotta be ready to back it up. Um, so I fully expect that China will continue to try to coerce our allies, and then it will be a test of, the, of American policymaking, whether we can back that up. Um, I do think that there are expectations that the United States would back up its allies, but I don't think it was necessarily brought up, brought up by um, what Kurt said or what Tony said in these meetings. I think they're strategically expected um, and would be there regardless of any of those statements, but absolutely this is a test of American resolve um, a test of American support of its allies, um, and it as it has been for a while. And I think that's just a natural part of the competitive dynamic we're having. Charlie? Yeah, I, I would uh, I would agree with that and say that it absolutely creates an expectation, uh, but also creates an expectation not only of uh, US resolve, but of dealing with the most salient issue uh, to many countries in the region, 
uh, because while there is the military competition, uh, it is the tools of economic leverage uh, that have greatest effect and utility. Uh, and the only thing I would say on this is there are a lot of ideas being kicked around about what this would mean in practice, what it would look like to operationalize this. Uh, in, in On scale, that means something greater than will all Americans go out and buy some Australian wine for the next little while. Uh, and the question is, when one particular ally or partner is on the receiving end of economic coercion because it's taken political actions that Beijing dislikes, what is the expectation of and from the United States and other allies and partners? I think there's a lot of nascent thinking uh, about this, everything from the fully robust, an Article 5 for economic uh, measures, which uh, that's a great thing to say, but what that means in practice uh, is a lot more to be developed too coming out with coordinated sanctions and tariffs, much like we saw this morning uh, against those very officials in Xinjiang who are responsible for what's happening. Uh, so I would just say uh, the final point is that sticks, I think, in both the administration's mind, but also around the region, is taking this problem on of economic uh, coercion on our own is a losing proposition. Uh, and that's especially true for smaller nations that are more, more exposed and more able to be coerced. Australia has 33% of its trade that goes to China, even after all of uh, this you know, uh, rhetoric that's come out and even after they've shut off some of those. The question is, how can you begin to leverage the combined capabilities of the um, allied and partner nations around the region? And I think that combining and looking for solidarity in numbers and resources is really where this is heading towards. Thanks, Charlie. That was a great question, Robert. Thank you for that. Um, the next question comes in, um, and I think this could apply to everybody, but I expect uh, Charlie, Robert, Shioko um, would have uh, thoughts on it especially. It comes from uh, Gunther Rosenitz, excuse me, Rosenitz, who's director of the uh, Austrian Peace Academy, um, asking what role does the EU and perhaps Germany specifically play in the US new strategy for Asia? Um, I think it's a great question. We've seen the, a lot of European countries playing a more of a significant role in Asia uh, over the last few years, and especially in the last few months with some naval deployments. I'm curious about where you all see this going into the long term. Uh, Shihoko, uh, your, your thoughts. Yeah, um, just on the, the trade front, um, perhaps I can focus on that. The uh, Washington was disappointed when uh, the European Union signed a trade deal with uh, China uh, shortly before the advent of the Biden administration. It was seen as a, as a big blow and also um, as a lack of confidence in US stewardship for an international trade order. Um, what we are seeing though more broadly is that the Europeans are coming up um, both as the as EU as an institution, but also individual countries, most notably uh, Germany, um, as well as France and separately from the UK, um, bilateral, multilateral approaches to dealing with the China threat. So they all have their own uh, Indo-Pacific strategies, uh, nascent Indo-Pacific strategies that are being played out at the moment. So there does, there is a great deal of opportunity uh, for cooperation on the Indo-Pacific. But I think one of the more interesting developments that we can expect is that although the European Union wants to work closely together with Washington we have opportunities to work together with Washington when it comes to facing the challenge, the China challenge. What we are also seeing is that they also want to work with the other uh, parties in in the region in Asia, uh, bypassing the United States. So uh, we see, for instance, um, Brexit is happening, it has happened, uh, but Japan and the UK signed a free trade. A bilateral free trade agreement. And Japan is really kind of acting as the steward for Britain to really be able to manifest itself as global Britain. So Britain is now being considered for a, 
accession to the new TPP, the CPTPP. Um, Japan had actually given, um, had been very much um, against uh, the United Kingdom leaving the EU. It came up with this big uh, campaign to actually push uh, the UK from joining, the, uh, from abandoning the European Union. But once Brexit happened, what Japan, the Japanese government has done is very publicly also give guidance to Britain about what this actually means and what the next steps can be for Britain to ensure that Japan, Japanese companies and uh, Japanese economic cooperation on a bilateral front is done. And that's with the understanding that the two sides share this mutual concern on the one hand about trying to be less dependent on China on the one hand, and also to have stronger bilateral ties that don't necessarily involve the United States or the other. Thank you, Shihoko. Um, I'm not seeing other folks jumping in on this. So um, the next question comes from the great John Brandon from the Asia Foundation, uh, asks, saying uh, the US, China, Japan, Korea, I should say South Korea and India are all concerned about the deteriorating situation in Burma. ASEAN seems unable to manage its biggest regional security challenge. How might these countries cooperate to help uh, try to bring a solution to the violence and instability taking place in Myanmar? Um, we also know that um, the United States, this is, that was John's question, I would add, that we also know that Japan and the United States have quite different approaches to the issue in Myanmar, I expect, as does India, um, as certainly as does China. Curious about your perspectives on um, the role that Myanmar um, is playing, the Myanmar coup is playing in the region where you see that headed and its effect on the United States and the, the other major countries in the region. Uh, Michael, why don't you talk a bit about India and how that's, uh, how Myanmar plays into that and how that may affect our relationship there. Yeah, I wouldn't overstate uh, the impacts of the developments there on uh, on the U.S.-India relationship. There have been some some statements um, <clears throat> from both countries, from both Washington and New Delhi, um, calling for the restoration of democracy. And obviously, India has a much more much different relationship with Myanmar than the United States does. Um, but I, I really don't have much to say on this. I don't really think it's going to play a big role at all uh, in the bilateral relationship. I'm not sure. The extent to which it came up um, when uh, Secretary of Defense Austin was there certainly didn't come up in, in, in public remarks. But I guess you could argue that um, to the extent that the, uh, the emphasis on the messaging of the US and India being two democracies working together to strengthen democracy at home and abroad from that lens, certainly I think that that would suggest that there could be um, additional messaging, future messaging from both India and the United States um, calling attention to the need for the restoration of, of democracy in, in Myanmar, but we haven't really seen all that much to this point. Okay, Robert, wondering if you could talk a bit about um, the, uh, how this fits in, how the Chinese are reacting to this and how, um, um, the, how China may approach instability in Myanmar. I think we've actually done fairly well so far to treat Myanmar uh, in terms of what the people of Myanmar desire, rather than to treat it as a subset of US-China competition. And right after the coup, there were a lot of suggestions that here for the Biden administration was an early test case of a fierce competition for US-China regional influence. And there were various forms of invitation to view it that way, including the views of many people within Myanmar itself, who have attacked Chinese-owned factories and in some cases Chinese business people, and who have uh, raised the prospect, for which the best of my knowledge, there's no evidence to date, uh, that China was behind uh, the coup. And I think that we've so far, uh, you're smiling, I don't know, maybe I missed a piece of evidence, let me know. Um, but I think that we've done well to avoid framing it in that way. Uh, so that I think in that, you know, so far, uh, so good in not making the error of seeing everything in the region as a, U, as a case of US-China competition. We have tried to work with Singapore, which has tremendous investments uh, in the area to see if there is leverage there. And as Shihoko mentioned, we've been in dialogue with uh, Japan and other regional uh, you know, countries that have a greater interest that, than we. And I think that that multilateral approach and not framing it just in terms of US-China competition 
uh, is wise and uh, the, the bait wasn't taken. And so I think, you know, while there's no end in sight on this, so far so good. There's also no reason to think uh, based on the past actions of the, the Myanmar military and of Aung San Suu Kyi, who visited China many times, that China would necessarily have a clear preference one way or the other. Uh, the the, the, the uh, generals have taken actions that China was displeased with and Aung San Suu Kyi has been fairly open to China. Uh, so I think that we've managed to get it right so far. Thank you so much. Uh, other, other comments on, on Myanmar? Can I just say one thing? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so for Japan, the, the situation in Myanmar really becomes a, a test case for how the uh, Japan and the United States can work together on a values-based diplomatic front. So um, Japan's foreign policy has never really been driven by uh, you know, promoting democracy, um, unlike the United States, uh, but it has played as a, a strong tool for Japan to work closely together. Uh, with with uh, Washington. Japan has one of the biggest investments in Myanmar. So there is a great deal of uh, pressure uh, from the Japanese business community to ensure that there is first and foremost stability in Myanmar. And stability uh, from that perspective would mean not preclude uh, communicating, communicating with the military leadership um, and not simply um, talking about, you know, uh, reflecting the voice of the people, but also working together and listening and having a way to uh, engage in dialogue with all parties involved. Well, thanks to everybody. Um, we are going to uh, um, wind up here. We're going to, I'm going to ask everybody one last question. We'll go in reverse order. Um, to close things out. And uh, the question is, as uh, uh, King George says in the musical Hamilton, what comes next? Uh, for each of your areas of expertise, I'd like you to look ahead. We've had this flurry of diplomacy. We've had an interesting exchange in Anchorage. We had secretaries traveling out to the region, reports that North Korea may be up to some no good. We have political calendars um, coming into the fore in a lot of countries. I'd um, be curious about, from your perspectives, what are the key issues that we need to keep, keep an eye out on um, uh, in the next six months to a year? Um, so, and we'll, as I said, we'll go in reverse order as the introduction. So Charlie, uh, you're first. Oh, okay. Now I have to come up with them first too. Um, so uh, I would note that, uh, look, the calendar will dictate some of this. Uh, the meetings that will be planned as hopefully travel restrictions ease hopefully more of them as well. But I, I guess I would point to um, two things to look for uh, about uh, what next. Uh, the first, um, expect more coordination uh, from not only the countries of the Quad that we talked, but a larger grouping than that. We had that question about Germany broadening up to the EU. Uh, even while we were having this webinar, uh, we saw coordinated action taken by uh, the EU plus the US plus others on sanctioning Chinese officials who are directly responsible for what has been taking place in Xinjiang. I would expect to see more examples of substantive coordination on policy movement. And I think that that is likely to uh, increase in tempo as we move towards the announced uh, but not yet planned or the planned but not yet announced uh, democracy summit. Uh, showing that there actually can be uh, deliverables. The second thing I would say to look for next is uh, resources, budgets. Uh, the US budget is still uh, to be uh, unveiled. We know that there's a China strategy and review uh, being held not only in the Department of Defense, but across the entire interagency. Um, at the very beginning of our conversation, uh, Ambassador Roy uh, stated that uh, this was uh, can not only be in the military realm, uh, although the United States needed to have a deterrent edge. And I would say that's not where this is playing out because if partisan support, we see that there's already been an announcement by Chuck Schumer leading eight different Senate committees to roll out at the very least $110 billion worth of funding in the Endless Frontiers Act, which is primarily centered on technological coordination, R&D, um, and 
information uh, uh, research. So I would say both a budget uh, in the US and across the other countries, but also in policy coordination is where I would look for what happens next. Thank you, Charlie. Jean Lee. Yeah, I would say in the near term, we will be watching for the Biden administration's Korea policy review, particularly uh, how the Biden administration takes North Korea's expanded missile and nuclear arsenal into consideration uh, and how it avoids reverting to strategic patience and also whether it's flexible and creative enough to move past the sticking points of past negotiations and really move those uh, negotiations into the future. Uh, and, and, and also whether or not it, uh, the United States is able to really uh, build on this strategy of a, re a regional cooperation to try to bring North Korea out of isolation. And in the short term, it a couple of things we'll be watching for is, can they use vaccinations as a way to draw them out? Is sports diplomacy, uh, even something as something like the Tokyo Olympics or the Beijing Olympics, will that be an opportunity for diplomacy? Uh, and then as you mentioned, absolutely keeping an eye on how, how North Korea responds uh, to all of this diplomacy, and in, partic in particular on perhaps a tightened sanctions regime, uh, and, and whether it takes advantage of the opportunities that are presented in, in the next uh, six months or so. Great. Thank you, Gene. Uh, next is Michael Kugelman. Yeah, thanks, Abe. So I think that in the immediate term, uh, looking at the bilateral U.S.-India relationship, all eyes will be on the S-400 deal. Uh, you know, the big question is, will India actually uh, decide to cancel uh, the deal? I think that's very unlikely. I think it's going to go through it. If it does not cancel it, and if the, uh, the equipment comes to India, uh, will the U.S. extend a waiver uh, to avoid the sanctions package? I think that decision will really impact the, uh, the relationship in a big way moving forward. Again, I think it's unlikely. Or pardon me, I think it's highly likely that there will be a, uh, a waiver, but we don't know yet. And uh, there's a lot of anxiety about that in New Delhi. Second, uh, I think we should expect to see the relationship with India broaden uh, again in a way that we saw um, before the Trump era. Uh, so I think we can expect to see a restoration of dialogue in a number of spaces that were underemphasized in the Trump era, particularly areas like clean energy cooperation, uh, climate change, uh, certainly health issues, a lot of non-security areas. Those will be emphasized more. We'll start seeing that. I think there's going to be a desire on both sides to try to start um, reducing uh, the pretty significant trade tensions in place over the last few years. That'll take time as well. Uh, I think there also will be a focus on trying to consolidate the gains made in the relationship over the last uh, few years and trying to operationalize that more. So in other words, trying to focus less on just the arms sales and the, the, the defense deals, but how to operationalize all that on the ground. But this is going to bring up a challenge that I think has become even more immediate as the India-China relationship has gotten more tense. And that is how do you move forward and really um, uh, deepen security relations between the US and India outside of an alliance system that India continues to claim that it will not enter. Uh, India has been very clear on that even, over, even after the, the deadly clash between uh, Indian and Chinese forces. Uh, and finally, I think when it comes to the Quad, this is something that India is fully behind right now in previous years, like uh, one or two other countries have been hesitant, but it's fully uh, invested in it right now. So I think that what India is going to be looking for is, is an indication that everyone is committed to making it um, a regularized mechanism uh, with the Secretariat, regular meetings, not necessarily super high level, but having regular series of meetings that's something that India is going to be looking for, because at this point, at least, it's fully invested in the quad and wants to build it out. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next is Shoko. Yeah, so in the immediate term, um, all eyes will be on Suga's visit to the White House and how successful that is and what the agenda will be. Uh, but really, for the Suga administration, first and foremost will be this issue of survival. So it will be focused very much on domestic policy and preparing for an election that has yet to be called. Um, that will 
uh, limit Tokyo's ability to focus um, cert, um, on foreign policy, certainly to come up with the kind of grand vision for Japan that Prime Minister Abe um, had been able to uh, push forward, whether or not one was in support or not of that particular vision, um, which is actually a lost opportunity for Japan, because as we talk about um, you know, middle powers, and uh, trying to hedge between these two hegemons in the shape of the United States and China. Japan actually has a great deal of experience in pushing back against China, um, whilst um, being a competitor, uh, having this uh, healthy rivalry with China on the economic front as well. Uh, so there is a lot of experience um, and a lot that other countries, can, including the United States, can actually learn from Japan's own um, agenda setting when it comes to dealing um, with this uh, balance. Oh, and one, one last thing. Uh, the real test, of course, for Japan to be uh, a regional stabilizer is going to, because the United States is, is expecting far more from, from Japan as well, um, is for, be, for it to be successful in coordinating uh, with the allies and partners in the region. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks, of course, is going to be South Korea. And I think that will continue to be a, a major issue. And I, I'm not expecting any major progress on that, especially as uh, Moon Jae-in uh, prepares for you know, the last year of his uh, presidency. Thank you so much, Shihoko. Uh, Robert Daly. I've already mentioned twice that I think the time is now right uh, for some sort of cooperative outreach, albeit on a small scale, which I think China would respond to, but I don't know that that is in the offing. I think for now, the administration's focus is going to remain on finishing up uh, these policy reviews, uh, which take a good deal of time. I think the policy reviews are in very good hands. Uh, and so the question is whether there's going to be over the next few months, any sort of, whether we have the good fortune to avoid action forcing events in US-China relations. And it would have to be very good fortune indeed because there are an awful lot of potential crisis points, large and small. But if we can avoid action forcing events, then there's gonna be an interregnum in which the administration finishes and then coordinates its policy reviews. During that same period, uh, it's been suggested that China might also be looking for a timeout of sorts as it prepares for this summer, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party uh, activities and then for the Winter Olympics coming up. So there may be a mutual desire uh, to what the Chinese call good gang good, uh, attend to our own domestic agendas for a while. Coming out of that, uh, there is a chance for Biden and Xi to meet. They will probably both be in Glasgow in November for the 26th UN uh, COP climate meetings. And that's about the right time uh, after the policy reviews to have a serious discussion. So that was something that we'll see later in the year. I don't think it'll all be smooth sailing in the interim, however to return to the nautical metaphor. Thank you, Robert. And uh, uh, thank you. And uh, next comes uh, Ray Zhang. Sure. Um, so unsurprisingly, the Chinese government has you know, paid attention to uh, the xenophobia sweeping the United States against people of Asian descent. Uh, over the last year, and it's raised this issue, um, usually trying in, in an attempt to sort of depict the United States as, you know, unstable, as, you know, unable to prevent these types of crimes from occurring. Usually in the process, it sidesteps conduct of, you know, Chinese police and serves as a, a purpose of trying to, you know, cut off uh, critiques of how Chinese law enforcement operates, China usually likes to sort of project its own law enforcement institutions as, you know, something that stabilizes society and it's necessary. It's also, you know, a, a issue of Chinese domestic sovereignty. So that's the diplomatic angle uh, that they've opted to interpret this as. Um, as I stated before, the sort of introspection is really needed on how the United States handles xenophobia overall. We've had in the past synagogues, black churches, Sikh temples, um, they've all been you know, attacked. And in, in some ways, they're, they're, these communities have been really shell-shocked by the violence they've had in, to endure. And so um, 
uh, unpacking bigotry, you know, this is the latest chapter that's an indicator that, that looking at racism is really, really, really an all hands on deck situation. And in China practice and uh, in China policy analysis, um, we really have to add to our responsibilities, the responsibility to look at home and um, seeing what we can do to protect our communities because the event horizon and the time horizon of foreign policy can be very, very lengthy. But in terms of the risks that are posed to you know, America and you know, different places where Asian people call home, um, you know, that's, that's a today issue. Thanks. Thank you. And I, I think there's a tendency in these, in our discussions, both privately and publicly, to sort of separate um, the traditional work of policy uh, from discussions of what's happening in the United States, especially when it comes to um, issues of discrimination, hate, and violence um, that we most recently saw in Atlanta against uh, people of Asian descent. Um, but I think it's obvious that these are that the, there's a linkages that we need to recognize. I think it's really important. I'm really glad that we had Ray to come speak about that, that Jean recognized it in her remarks. And I think just by having these discussions integrated into the broader policy discussions, I think it highlights the importance of these issues and something that we all need to work on um, and, and continue to discuss. The Wilson Center did put out a statement on Friday on, on these issues. Um, and I'm just, um, and I think it's an ongoing challenge that we're all gonna address. And I hope that we continue to integrate these discussions into other discussions about American foreign policy and strategy. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, Shoko Goto, Robert Daly, Jean Lee, Charlie Adele, Ray Jong, State Roy, uh, for participating in this discussion. Um, also want to thank uh, Lucas Myers in the background handling our, the Q&A from uh, the outside world. Um, and also to thank our uh, excellent uh, uh, colleagues at the AV team, uh, Sharona Harris and John Tyler. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time.